Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. A Victorian who saw uh, the disaster of uh, 2020 unfold in the state from the inside uh, was Sanjeev uh, Sablog, who until September 2020 was an economist with the Victorian Department of Treasury and Finance. He resigned his position as he could, believed he could no longer be uh, complicit nor be silent uh, about a government which was continuing to pursue a police state policy as their only uh, public health response. Uh, Sanjeev has worked, uh, he had worked in the Victorian Public Service since 2001 when he migrated to Australia from India. He is now an Australian citizen. Before migrating to Australia, he was also a public servant in the Indian Administrative Service. He resigned his position there also on a matter of principle due to the policies and operations of the then uh, corrupt Indian Socialist Government in power at the time. He has subsequently become an activist against the continued Victorian and Australian government responses uh, to uh, coronavirus cases, which are made up of uh, lockdowns, border closures, government surveillance through contact tracing measures, mandatory masks, and now uh, mandatory by stealth vaccinations. He has given speeches at the various pro-freedom rallies in Melbourne, organised uh, by Reignite Democracy Australia and the Melbourne Freedom Rally organisation. And just this week, he has launched the Team Australia political movement, which aims to be a political third force in future elections, particularly the next Victorian state election due in November 2022, bringing together a coalition of community activists, a leaders and also political parties to fight what Team Australia calls public health terrorism. There's a lot to learn from Sanjeev and I'm pleased he's my guest tonight. Welcome to Wilmsfront. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'm really happy to be here on a show which has been, you know, raising all these complex issues over the last uh, many, many months. So happy to be here. Yeah. Now, you've spent your entire, almost your entire career in the, the, the public service, both in India and Australia. Now, a public service job uh, these days has the reputation, which has increased particularly in the pandemic economy, of being the most secure job. You get a lowerish workload than you would in the private sector with easier KPIs. I, I want to uh, uh, get your uh, perspective on why did you decide to dedicate your your life to a public service position because I'm sure it wasn't uh, what I just described yeah so I think the uh, the initial role that I uh, joined was in the Indian administrative service in India which is the senior most uh, executive service there where uh, all the senior most roles in the government are managed straight from the beginning by members of the service it's almost like saying you you start off at the rank of a lieutenant colonel in the army or something it's a very very senior role you start off at that and uh, you manage a hell of a lot of stuff uh, what what it does is it gives you a great opportunity to help people uh, because if you are doing the right thing uh, you presumably will help people so uh, I, I began that career uh, with the commitment to uh, do my best for india and for my fellow citizens and of course i soon realized that the system is entirely rotten and corrupt uh, I did study uh, abroad in Australia for a year and USA for five years, and I did some other studies as well. So finally, I came to the view that I need to change the political system of India. And I don't mean the system, which is a democracy, but I need to change the political parties. And uh, uh, all the parties are socialist, even till today, they're all completely socialist. So I have uh, been working on a project to create a liberal party for India, which I have succeeded in doing in 2013. And so it's been uh, going on for some time. So, but in the meanwhile, when I come here, when I came here, I didn't come with a commit, uh, you know, any desire to be in the public service. I could be anywhere. I could have been a McDonald, uh, you know, service boy or a coal trolley pusher. I was quite happy to do anything to 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 get out of India, and uh, I got a job here, you know, as a researcher in um, Victorian Workover Authority, and later I, I I became an executive there, and then I I moved to the Treasury as an economist, which I thought was an interesting role because I learned a hell of a lot, and I've written a lot uh, in terms of the books and other things and articles learned from the way Australia works. Now, people who have not worked in this uh, one, a third world government like India and a first world government like Australia might conflate potentially that the 
Uh, bureaucrats are pretty, pretty much the same. The, the system is the same. Actually, it's radically different. And that's, uh, the, that, that's the content of my books. You know, this one here, this right in front of me, uh, Breaking Free of Nehru, I wrote in 2008. This describes the governance systems of India and Australia in great detail and, and explains why these countries are so different. If you, if you land up in India, you'll realize it's a total mess. But as you start functioning there as a business, you will realize it's, it's horrendously corrupt. Out here, the corruption levels are dramatically lower. And the system has got much greater levels of accountability. So I was always uh, recommending and advocating a governance system on the lines of Australia for India. And that's been uh, the part of the work, you know, in the political party that I've been uh, working on there. So it was an absolute shock to me uh, that the system collapsed, which is why this, the broken state. Where does it come? Yeah, yeah. So this is the great history and broken state. This is my second uh, main book. They have written a uh, few others and still writing a few more. But the the broken state here in uh, in in, in Victoria was a completely unexpected event in my life. I, I I do believe, by the way, that public servants are not just sitting there idle. I, I mean, yes, uh, there are some occasions, and I do know there were lots of occasions when, in Christmas holidays, I was basically doing my own research, studying things because there's not much workloads. Uh, but there are times, and there are plenty of times when you're so deadly busy, you work till late night, ten o'clock, till twelve o'clock, and so on. So there have been those occasions as well. So public servants in India, for example, it's a twenty-four hour job at the senior level. So no, they, the, the, it's not the uh, the leisure part. It's not even the money. In fact, in India, you get practically no money. Uh, but here, at least there's some reasonable money. It's basically the capacity for a person to directly influence public policy uh, in, 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 a, in a public service job. So I actually would recommend that the best talent of every country consider, uh, yes, by all means, the uh, private sector, but also consider, uh, you know, uh, working inside the government because the government cannot function well if the, if the advisory people are of not high quality. So... Yeah, so that's the broad thing that, yes, there, there is a role for uh, public servants. That's a uh, role I wanted to play. I also learned uh, about politics in the process. Yeah. Well, uh, ultimately, we, we do want the, the best and most motivated and inspired people, both in the, the public service and uh, going into or, uh, becoming elected parliamentarians themselves. So, But uh, you... Uh, been in the, the 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 public service of Victoria nearly twenty years uh, before the the pandemic uh, hit. So obviously you learnt a lot about the Victoria how the public Victorian public service operated uh, during that time. And like, I was uh, even though I am a, a journalist and, and commentator, I I don't have the inside in inside insight that uh, you uh, uh, you bring to uh, b both your activism and, and commentary uh, but when the the first national lockdown happened in in Mar at the end of March uh, 2020 it was was clear uh, to me uh, uh, that uh, Victoria uh, was going to go with a a police state enforcement response uh, during the first First way, first national lockdown. Victoria issued the the most fines, had the strictest restrictions. Uh, for, for example, golf was banned in Victoria, which it wasn't anywhere else. And we began to see uh, dictator Dan in in full flight with his finger wagging threats. Uh, we now now through subsequent uh, reports that this police state approach to public health was partly due to the fact that Victoria was uh, woefully inadequate to tackle. Uh, a pandemic. Uh, what, what did you see beginning uh, when it started to became obvious that the the, the pandemic, the the COVID, was going to be spreading throughout Australia? Well, there are two parts to this. Uh, I, I, the second part is uh, uh, a thing which I would actually disagree with, uh, but the first part I fully agree with, uh, which is that the uh, response was draconian. And uh, so, uh, what has happened here was that. Sometime in the middle of February, uh, we, I, we could see that, you know, Italy has started copying the Chinese model. So it was very obvious that lockdowns had never been imposed in human history before. So that is the first thing that is known to everybody in the world. Uh, but we also knew that a lot of panic was being created by the videos coming out from China. Uh, what we did also know uh, is that this method of, uh, you know, lockdowns was extraordinarily disproportionate to the actual risk. Anybody with the basic data on the on the on the on the fatalities uh, that were taking place as a result of uh, the lock uh, the the COVID uh, thing in, in Wuhan 
would see that this was affecting the very elderly. Okay, so what is very clear to me and to clear to everybody, in fact, in the in the treasury, there were so, so many economists and we were not shut down at that time. We were talking to each other and everybody was very clear that this particular pandemic had a very straightforward solution. You protect the elderly, you look after them very carefully and you, uh, you know, do the normal social distancing or whatever. That was very clear within the treasury to almost everybody. And on the 28th of February, I wrote an email. I wrote a number of emails, uh, I think on the 20th of February and, and around that date, where I explained this uh, strategy to my bosses and uh, you know, at the very senior most levels in the treasury that this is what I would expect. We would not be copying the Wuhan and Italy, Italian approach. And there was no such intention at that stage to do so. And the reason was, which I discovered later, because I was not on top of that particular pandemic plan of Victoria, but on the 10th of March, we had already got lots of pandemic plans in Australia, including in Victoria. But on 10th of March, our Victorian pandemic plan was updated and published by the Minister for Health. And that plan was very clear. It said that this particular uh, virus, we have assessed it. It is of moderate intensity, and that's the language they use. And that uh, we are fully prepared for any contingency, including if it's uh, found to be much worse in the in the future. Uh, there was no mention at all of lockdowns because lockdowns had never been even considered, uh, <laughs> have been had been considered actually in a couple of places, but rejected outright. Uh, so in the science literature, in, because proportionality, as you, you know, if you look at uh, the public health law or any law for that matter, all our laws in Australia are really good. The first thing is they are risk based. Okay, uh, work at health and safety, for example, where I worked for five years, is risk based. You do not uh, do disproportionate things. You know, to save lives, you you don't go on, uh, you know, creating barriers like nuclear wall against a single, you know, like a factory or something. So everything is got to be proportionate, and that business of risk based analysis, analysis and proportionality underpins good governance. Uh, but in this case, uh, so the risk-based approach in this case was very clear. But what then happened uh, was, uh, and I've written this in my book, but a much more detailed analysis has happened later in my open letter to the uh, age, uh, intelligence agencies of the world. So along with ten other, uh, nine other people across the world, including General Spalding from the USA, Michael Singer of uh, a lawyer, uh, Stacey Rudin, and many others, I've co-signed a letter in which I contributed to some extent as well, in which it is very clear that we have seen uh, the influence of uh, uh, essentially China planting this whole exercise. And uh, one of the key elements of that, so in my book, there's a full chapter on this issue, but much more detail in that letter is what I'm suggesting here, that on that, uh, the whole, on the 16th of March, we see the Neil Ferguson model. Neil Ferguson is an absolute scoundrel. Uh, you know, you can't get a bigger scoundrel than him uh, pretending to be a scientist. Uh, all his modeling from the very beginning has been so way off from reality. But this guy, and by the way, he's a theoretical physicist. He has got a zero understanding of biology. He doesn't even know what's a cell, biological cell. He doesn't understand anything. And he was made an epidemiologist and given the charge of these models. And China has been funding the Imperial College very dramatically. Xi Jinping has gone there 2015. And so what we see is that this great guy, along with the 29 other people, publishes a model which is then widely covered by the international media uh, all over the world. And that says that uh, the UK will see 500 million people die. Uh, sorry, no, 500,000 people die, half a million, if they do not impose lockdowns. Okay. And now he has admitted, if you read his latest work in, I think, in one of the newspapers uh, about a month ago, he said that if Italy had if it, Italy had not done the lockdowns, we could not have done them in the UK. So this guy was using the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, Italy was a Belt and Road Initiative country uh, of China. You're aware of the 55 countries or something they've done the Belt and Road Initiative or 68 or something. And Italy is one of them. Of course, uh, Dan Andrews is one of them as well. He's one of the key drivers of this uh, hysteria across the world. Uh, I would say completely paid and in the in the in the in the pay of China. That's my uh, you know allegation for Dan Andrews and his stooges. So what happens is that this uh, the hysteria is planted. We have this uh, you know with all the fake videos. This guy does the lockdowns. He's he's bought this uh, WHO guy Tedros. Uh, he's, that's in his pocket because he's actually appointed him. If you look at the history, he he got all the uh, Belt and Road guy you know countries to vote for him. So now we have a situation where the Imperial College model is then used to absolutely maximize the hysteria across the world. And the recommendation of this man, Ferguson, is lockdowns, all right? Now, I at the same time, I had written to uh, Ferguson myself because I was conducting, I was writing articles uh, for Times of India, plenty of them at that time. And one of them, I, I had conducted a study of this model. 
and I asked him, so what did you control for the fact that this whole thing is really falling on the elderly? The risk based is actually for the elderly. Why do you why did you even recommend lockdowns? He said, if you if you only do, uh, do the elderly, that's called cocooning under the epidemiological uh, modeling, uh, you would save about, uh, you know, you would still get about 60 percent of the deaths or something. Or sorry, you would save 60 percent of the deaths. So, so I said, why don't we at least do that? Why don't you just focus on that and so on? So but he, what has happened here is we had this massive influence of China, Jinping, fake videos, uh, funding by, of, of research institutions by China, which led to this fake modeling, funding of China, of the media across the world, which is, by the way, very well proven that 2 million people planted by China in various uh, you know, uh, companies across the world, that is on the Australian. None of the stuff I'm saying is outside the standard knowledge. So we, all this stuff goes in. And the existing models, the existing pandemic plans of Australia and Victoria are then basically torn into shreds. On the 10th of March, we have a really, really nice pandemic plan. I support it 100%. There is nothing wrong with that plan. But by the, 20, but by the 17th or 18th or whenever this uh, whole thing started, the decision at cabinet to shift, uh, copying basically the models, uh, you know, what is going on in the UK, uh, at that stage, we basically burn that and start copying Jinping. There is no precedent in human history of these lockdowns. There is no question of having a quarantine for a, for a respiratory virus of this sort because there are very good reasons why it's not there. In fact, I've got so many expert things, you know, I won't go into details, but uh, Jayanta Bhattacharya, for example, explains why this is not feasible. Anders Stegnell, who is the you know, chief epidemiologist of Sweden, explains why this is not the right thing. And there's so many, there's so much literature to say that quarantines are not appropriate, but self uh, you know, isolation at home is the appropriate remedy in this case. So what we see is the abandonment. And then the second part of your question comes in, that Victoria was not prepared. I refute that 100%. Victoria was 100% prepared for a pandemic of the sort because we, everything had been fully anticipated that this is what's going to happen. We're going to people, you know, ask people to stay at uh, home when they're sick, uh, socially distance themselves, and maybe a one or two workplaces where it's a very high density, uh, you know, uh, people, we might uh, temporarily shut them down. There was no mention of lockdown. So what, what, what we see is that Victoria then went into this panic mode and said, we are going to quarantine people for this thing. Now, imagine a, a thing you're trying to quarantine for a, for a thing which is basically impossible to even catch hold of. You don't even know whether it is there or not because half of them are asymptomatic. And so you start this madness which, uh, and you get 36 hours to do that. So you know, Jennifer Coates' uh, inquiry is very, very illuminating. Uh, but it doesn't examine the question, why did they do the quarantine in the first place? Uh, but it does acknowledge very clearly, and I've written an article in The Spectator, which explains this very thoroughly, that uh, the Victorian plan said very clearly, and that is the 10th of March plan, and that is well prepared, that's exactly what we should have been done, that people will isolate at home. Now, what is the... So one, once the whole world has gone berserk, as you see, they're copying the China model, how do we know who is doing the right thing. And we do have, in this case, a very good, very good, but brilliant example of standard Stegnell, which is Sweden. So one of the reasons why Sweden did not copy China is because Sweden has a very bad relationship with China. And, and these guys have, like out here, Dan Andrews actually physically was meeting the consulate of China at that period of time. And he went around claiming that China has done a brilliant piece of work to, uh, to save the world from this thing. Dan Andrews is a complete traitor to Australia. He should be tried for treason, is my view. So this guy was basically promoting China in the middle of this pandemic and promoting a model that is completely at odds and loggerheads with our own standard science and modeling. So uh, once this thing has started, basically, uh, we uh, what was my role? I'm not the one who's advising the cabinet on this matter. I'm advising cabinet on a number of things, even during the last you know, six months of my duration there, on particularly on pl urban planning matters. So the, my specialization was at that stage on urban planning policy. And so there's a lot of work that was going to cabinet. And there was a, um, the workloads increased quite dramatically. Okay, And one reason why they increased dramatically is because a lot of economists, the lady economists, uh, because the children at home, uh, who are then they looked after, you know, they're forced to look after the children at home. Uh, therefore, they had to drop off from the workforce. They had to take extended leave. So the workforce inside the government shrunk dramatically. The cabinet submissions multiplied. So the workloads increased quite dramatically at that time. And, and I was advising cabinet on a very regular basis on certain policies, not on this particular one. However, I was advising my, I was writing plenty of articles in the Times of India uh, about this issue. I wrote 17 articles in about six months. 
I shared most of these articles with my uh, staff, local uh, fellows, uh, fellow colleagues in, in the treasury, and also mentioned many of these findings to the, uh, at the, at the team meetings with the senior people. But I, do, I discovered very soon that our senior people were not willing to listen. Now, this is one of the things I mentioned in the book that as the, as the working from home started, the engagement, the possibility of engaging with senior people like, you know, deputy secretary on the uh, walking by on the, on the, on the, you know, corridor, uh, that disappeared completely. So you could not, uh, you know, talk to them and say, hey, guys, these guys are not listening. There's something really wrong going on. So the, it became like a complete Nazi organization, a dictatorial organization with top to bottom and like an army. You could not, you had to go through the channel to communicate to anybody. And that meant that the uh, system broke down of uh, the, the co collegiality and the in internal sharing of knowledge that broke down inside the government. Uh, finally, uh, when I started a comment, when the, when the Victorian government people started beating up, when Dan Andrews' uh, you know, branch uh, of uh, Stasi or whatever you call them in Nazi Germany, uh, you know, uh, that was, I think, Mussolini, but, uh, you know, these, these SSS, uh, yeah, Gestapo, well, these guys, uh, his Gestapo started going, beating people on the streets uh, for not wearing a mask. And these are the women who were beating, beaten up were actually the ones who are young. They had absolutely no risk. If you look at the data, the, the people who get almost nothing, no harm, are uh, the women have a much lower level of uh, you know, risk than the men. And so this is a young woman with practically zero risk. And so these people are beating her up because they're allegedly protecting her health. I really don't know how, how could they dare to do that to their fellow citizen. And then that, that led to many other things. And then they started calling the protesters all sorts of names. Okay, So here's a police officer calling these guys tinfoil hat people or whatever, some rubbish names, okay? This is not the kind of police we want in, in a civilized society. So you can see what is going on that within the department, nobody's listening. It became a Nazi organization, a 100% Nazi organization from inside. No one was allowed to ask questions. If you raised uh, your, uh, your email concerns, uh, there was no response. I remember another economist has actually provided a detailed email. I don't have a copy, of course, uh, where he asked for a proper cost-benefit analysis of these policies. He was very concerned. He's a very senior economist, a good friend of mine. He raised this significant concerns and there was never a response. And of course, we were talking to each other. So we really had a lot of frustration at the way things are going. But then uh, not everybody can leave the job. I decided when I was asked to remove my posts about this being a police state, because not everybody has a social media account and not everybody has this uh, articles in Times of India. So I was very public at that stage about my criticism of these policies. And, uh, and, and when the government asked me this, uh, you know, the department asked me to remove my comment about the police state. And also they said, remove any indirect criticism of uh, this, these government's policies. That meant I had to remove thousands and thousands of my posts. I also had to remove all my Times of India articles because in all of them, I was recommending a different policy. So that was the end of my uh, job there. When we saw the, the Wuhan lockdown in, was it February of, of 2020, we, we looked at it where the, the, there was obviously the reports of the, the, the welding of the doors and the perspective of, of, of us watching in a free, uh, open Australia at the time, well, they're a communist country, of course, that's what they do. Uh, but <laughs> looking back yes, on it, right. it's so shocking that the whole world mm. has adopted uh, this uh, police state response and i i wrote uh, you just you, you just gave a brief overview of the the police state that we experienced in the the second wave uh, the other uh, the the rest of the the western nations have followed the the melbourne model of of lockdown and uh, and enforcement the the the, the whole the, the if you go back here, the whole uh, uh, prospect of, of house arrest that uh, uh, that the police are going to break into your homes, uh, look in cupboards to see if you're you're hiding people, that's uh, a year and a half ago. That would be absolutely chilling to people. And obviously, with the the the, the second wave, we saw the restrictions and police state respond escalate. And you you talked you, you talked about the well, the, the most obvious way to to make sure that you reduce fatalities in a pandemic is quarantine the the sick and the vulnerable and in victoria's second wave uh, the all the, the 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 healthy people were quarantined uh, but the state failed to protect the vulnerable by all the aged care outbreaks and deaths as well it was a completely yes. perverse outcome perverse yes
That's a very good point you make. Uh, this is one of the, the that's a, that's the key allegation in my uh, complaint to the International Criminal Court. Remember, uh, crimes against humanity are not committed necessarily in war. They're committed in peacetime as well. And uh, and uh, Article Seven of the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court makes clear, you know, that the conditions and all the conditions have been met. And so these are crimes against humanity. Uh, one of the key things is when you pursue. Uh, the, you invert the so they have basically inverted the risk uh, you know management approach risk management says thou shalt proportionately do you look after the elderly as you said now we don't want to quarantine the elderly we, we mean isolate the elderly or otherwise look after them but that would have been the right approach risk based approach what they did was they flipped it around and said i will control all the young people so there are 98% people are, you know, who basically have no risk or 99% people. And so they're going to start controlling everybody. That was the complete inversion of risk management. It's the complete reversal of good policy. Now, in the process, the people who are actually at risk, they were bundled around here and there. And I have uh, not got the full details, but I've heard that they were sick people being introduced, you know, into the uh, nursing homes from from hospitals or vice versa. So there was a complete neglect of the elderly who should have been protected, and I'm not using the word quarantine, but protected, and, and the cocooning of the elderly in a, in a humane manner, in a careful manner, is what the government should have done. Instead of doing that, which they, because, you know, if you are spending all your time in chasing up after the people who are walking around on, uh, without a mask on the street, if you spend all your time on that, and remember, every time an incident occurs, guess what happens? There's a report provided to the premier. The premier then has to go through that report, provide and, and use his time and so on. So everybody's time is funneled into looking after these 98% who are actually at no risk. And so we see the flipping of the whole situation where the elderly, which actually then suffer more in the process. In addition, there is massive mental harm and potentially long term uh, you know, a reduction in the lifespan of the young. So we have a, 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 a dual hit, So which, which means we actually killed more people in this process in Victoria than we would have done if we just had done the right uh, risk-based approach. Now, your resignation from the Victorian public service mm. because there's there's not many people like you who uh will, will give up their uh, their their job on principle uh, particularly in these un uncertain times and so it was big news in september of 2020 where well it it, it was probably the the darkest month there the the slow roadmap out of uh, lockdown was announced uh, we had the the daily dan press conferences getting uh, nastier. Yeah. Uh, you've, you, you appeared in both uh, uh, mainstream uh, media on uh, on shows and also in print as well, and also uh, in the independ independent media as well, such as uh, this yeah. one as well. You've also become a uh, ferocious blogger as well on your, your own uh, personal website, which is Sadblock City. Uh, uh, dot com. Uh, so there's plenty of your your writings there, and you, uh, when I say you're a ferocious writer, uh, you are. Uh, your, uh, <laughs> your your documents, uh, proposals, they go for for many ma many pages, which is uh, well, you, you've just uh, in the in this interview sh uh, so far shown the the depth uh, of your knowledge as well, and also you've become uh, politically active as well you you've spoken at uh, many of the 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 melbourne anti-lockdown pro pro freedom rallies and well it's refreshing that we're not that much of a police state where you can speak out have your your free speech and you're not disappeared or or suicided and and that uh, but <laughs> yes uh, not a the center of uh, you know who's locked up and disappears yes exactly yes so uh, ha have you found uh, uh, going from obviously uh, well, that career in the public service to now, well, you were an activist in in India uh, yeah, uh, in your uh, in your later years uh, there. But uh, the 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 change, uh, it's the, the the refocus. Can you describe what that experience has been like for you? Yeah, it's been quite seamless as far as I'm concerned. Um, I have been fighting for liberty since at least 1998 i've been ferociously fighting for liberty uh you can see my entire health has got damaged very badly in the process massive rsi my eyes are completely strained and so on so i work like crazy 14 hours 15 hours a day and i do that i've been doing it for more than 
20 years. So it's not now uh, as a result of this particular thing, but it's been going on. Um, so there's uh, that. And therefore, the other one is that, you know, my political work in India is activist of the extreme order, which means going to villages, organizing crowds and, you know, talking to people. Um, and in fact, organizing resistance where necessary. So yes, I've been part of this uh, political journey uh, and activism in India for a long time. I have been working as an economist here, of course, as my full-time job initially, then as a part-time. So I was actually a 0.6 full-time FTE uh, for the last few years in the Treasury because I wanted to spend more time on the India project. So it has been quite seamless for me. Uh, I have been fighting for liberty for a long time. And a lot of people across the world, including the Trump administration and, and many other places, they're very familiar with me. I'm in close touch with people across the world. So uh, the idea that uh, you know my liberty can be trampled upon in the country, which I came to thinking that this will be the good place for me to sit here and actually reform India. So I came here as a kind of uh, refugee from India. Uh, you know, people come from communist countries. I've come from a practically communist country, which is India. And I'm sitting here and I'm trying to reform the country sitting here. I'm very happy for the opportunity. And then suddenly people uh, brutalize me itself sitting here. How did they brutalize me? I think the thing that really uh, got me completely off and it really annoyed me and I, was, I became very angry was the order that I should wear a mask when I'm walking in the public park. Yeah, uh, that that absurd, that was so ridiculous, absurd mask mandate, and that yeah, was. you've 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 spoken about just how uh, insanely that was enforced, and what they're they're those chilling images of police putting masks on on pro uh, protesters as well, and you've spoken about how during the the early times of the pandemic, you took it upon yourself to to wear a mask when you went to the. The, the supermarket, which, uh, which is, well, it's part of your... And by the way, that's exactly the point I made. I have been a mask fanatic, and I continue to be saying, I continue to say the following things, that if you are sure, so initially the data weren't, weren't very clear, and it was uh, better to be safe, but I took the precautions myself. I, I got my own masks, and I took my own precautions. Nobody had to tell me. I was wearing masks well before these guys even thought about the whole idea in the first place. But then when someone says that thou shalt wear a mask outdoors, I am not a fool, okay? If they take me to be a fool or a, or a, or a, or a servant of theirs, I think they're mistaken and that's, they, they just put me off. So I asked Brett Sutton on, uh, on Twitter, I put out a video saying, what the hell are you saying, Brett? Where's the proof of this thing? And in fact, his own article was there in which he actually said that masks are not required within the operation theaters itself. So he did the study in 2001 or something in which he said that for people who are not directly you know, uh, providing a service inside the operation theater don't need to wear a mask. So now the masks don't work even with, within the theater. And so you're saying that I should be sitting and wearing a mask outside. He didn't respond. After a few attempts, he blocked me on Twitter. That's the quality of our chief health officer. Guess what? He, does he think he's going to get away with it? Does Brett Brett Sutton think I'm going to sit quiet? He's provoked me, okay? He's like, you know, you, there's, a, there's a thing called a rattlesnake, okay? Very happily living his life, doing his own stuff. You trip, you trip on me and you get the response. I'm basically saying you never can touch me. And this was a, this is a physical action, okay? When somebody basically forces you to wear a thing and that's your mind doesn't agree with that because that's not exactly what you want. I will wear a mask at my, at my own, you know, when I'm comfort comfortable and when I'm persuaded about it. But I will not be forced into anything by anybody, including a so-called chief of, uh, health officer. So anyway, that was the, uh, that was the thing that provoked me. But then the seamless transition took place. So initially, I wasn't interested in politics. People were trying to connect me. Uh, a lot of people from the Liberal Party connected with me you know, and uh, had discussions. Uh, I initially thought maybe I should join the Liberal Party and this is all about Dan, uh, Dan Andrews. But I soon realized it's not Dan Andrews. It's actually about Scott Morrison. And therefore, I, after, wrote, after writing this book, which took me about 10 days, uh, you know, just after resignation, I finished it by, by the end of uh, September, early October. I finished it, on, I think, on the 3rd of October. Uh, then I moved straight into the International Criminal Court complaint. I finished that in about 20, 25 days, uh, punted it out. And by the time, I was hoping that people would start listening. Because I'd written articles. I'd written, you know, I'd started uh, so many interviews. I'd hoped, but then Dan Andrews was asked about my work. And he said, that's just my personal opinion. Well, I've been advising this character, Dan Andrews. He doesn't really know it because it, my name doesn't necessarily go in all the documents that reach him. But I've been advising him for the entire duration of his career as a, uh, as a premier because all the advice that is provided by me to cabinet uh, in, in my greens, they're called greens, okay? They go to the treasurer. They also go to the premier. And so I'm, I'm a guy, I'm competent enough to advise Dan Andrews otherwise, but then my opinion when it comes out on matter of uh, you know, public health policy is considered just an opinion. And that was another thing that they made a mistake. Never step on a rattlesnake. 
they, they stepped on me first by uh, by basically uh, forcing a mask on me. And second, when Dan Andrews said, it is just my personal opinion, I will show Dan Andrews what is my personal opinion. My personal opinion is the truth. And he is lying. And I will not spare Dan Andrews the punishment that he should get for telling lies to Victorians and therefore to our, our Australians for the whole of last year. Telling lies in public in a big, massive manner is a, is a complete, is basically criminal. And because the actions coming out from that are criminal. So no, he's... he's He's provoked the, you know, the, the response, which also, by the way, the youth, thousands of youth, I talk to them now, and they said that they were not at all aware of this existence of politicians. You know, they were basically not even aware what these guys do. And now they are so politically active, they are entering politics to displace these guys. So the good thing, of course, as a result of this is that there's been a massive awakening among the youth of Australia. For the first time in their life, they've realized that liberty is never given to you in a platter and that you have to fight for it. So that's that the transition from persuasion through articles and books and the complaint to the ICC moved straight away into the concept of potential political action. And I could not obviously act on my own because I'm a single individual. I needed to find a place to go because the Liberal Party was not suitable, I soon realized. So I needed a place to go and therefore I had to ask the young people if they're interested. So young people came up, they were interested. And so by the early February, I've been working on the political project. Uh, I, I don't think it's uh, the launch has been done yet. What we've been talking about is the soft launch is basically a proposal. Uh, the informed medical options party has signed up the Liberal Democratic Party. I'm having very strong discussions and they're very close to signing up. I think uh, the great Australian party. I've had long chats with them. They might sign up uh, the Australia one. I've been engaging with them and hopefully they'll sign up. So basically we're having three, four parties under active consideration to sign up for this movement. This will be a movement that goes and contests all the seats possible. You know, uh, the marginal seats, of course, in the federal elections. This is not just a state exercise this is all over Australia. Because remember, we have to get rid of Scott Morrison. So there are two targets of this exercise. One is to get rid of Dan Andrews. And the second is to get rid of Scott Morrison. These are personal targets. But of course, we need to get rid of all the other premiers as well who have done these uh, illegal things. So the first thing uh, out here is the education of the community. One of the things you will notice is that this is complicated stuff. People have taken it uh, like you had just uh, say, assumed that the quarantine was not done well. <clears throat> That's, by the way, a common mistake. <clears throat> People think that Victoria was not prepared and quarantine was not done well, well. But actually, it was not even required in this case. There's a big difference. Okay, It's required for Ebola. It's required for measles. It's not required for uh, respiratory uh, respiratory virus like this. So what is happening is a massive educational deficit at the moment because people have believed in Dan Andrews lies. You know, people believe naturally, you know, here's a politician he's telling us, he's a health guy, he's telling us he must be a doctor, he knows something. And I don't know that. So they assume that these guys know what they're saying. They have been telling lies repeatedly one after the other. And so my first project now, which I've been working on uh, through you know, communication, is that these guys are telling lies. Once the community wakes up, I believe, uh, Tim, there will be a massive, massive uh, impact, uh, uh, political impact for these guys as the opinion polls turn against them. And they realize that their, life, their jobs are on the line. This time, the public is not going to spare them. It's my prediction that you can make sure that this will happen because for Indira Gandhi, this is a good example. She imposed the uh, emergency in India in 1975 in June. For the first six months, people were just believing in whatever she said, you know. But after six months, the, 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 the people start thinking. And within a year and a half, she held the elections and she was wiped out personally, lost all the seats. Congress was completely made into a you know, minor fringe party. So the, 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 the Liberal and Labour parties, I, my, I, I would believe that if uh, there's a sufficient campaign and sufficient people get involved in finding the truth, that both the parties will be wiped out from Australia for the next, uh, you know, whatever, for the entire history of theirs. There'll be the no more Labour Party, no more Liberal Party because they have destroyed, they're basically treasonous parties. They're traitors. They have been following China. They have not followed, they followed Jinping to be precise. They are basically following, and by the way, Jinping has planted God knows how many people in research institutions in Australia who are paid by these guys. And so, and the media. So what we're seeing is a massive takeover of the, uh, the of Australia by China. We basically handed over Australia in the palms of China and destroyed the $400 billion. Imagine how many submarines, how much more defense we could have purchased if we had this money. We burned that money. Who has benefited? Only China. So we have basically handed over Australia to China. These guys, I think, are going to learn a bitter lesson. Politically, we don't want them anymore. Uh, so my transition from an economist uh, into a politician, 
uh, who is going, determined to you know make an impact uh, in terms of you know persuading the people. By the way, I don't I, I don't uh, make an impact at the voter. So every voter will have to decide for themselves whether they were misled or they were you know looked after by these politicians. Well, you would uh, be aware, being a, a very knowledgeable person, that it's a, a big task because we've seen with the, the elections so far during the, the era of COVID, the Queensland state election, the New Zealand general election and the upcoming WA election, that the, the, the pro-lockdown parties have been easily re-elected. Uh, but you're absolutely right over the past year there have been so many particularly young people who've who've woken up who before their lives were turned upside down by business shutdowns and 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 house house arrest were just living their lives i've featured many of them on this uh program and they've made uh, immense sacrifices themselves to to speak out and engage in in activism i put the uh, the the website just up before the uh, the uh, political, uh, you'd, uh, you'd call it political movement that uh, you've launched. Uh, so it's teamaustralia21.org. Uh, there was also, uh, I saw a news, uh, news.com.au article talking about it today. And uh, they, they've, they've, they've gone for the most sensational, sensational headline, <laughs> a quote from you, I can do a hell of a lot of uh, uh, damage. <laughs> Yeah, I think what's happened is there was a bit of a chat. This guy called me, Frank Chung calls me, and you know, I always am very pally and very friendly with everybody using the normal language. I didn't know he's recording or I don't know what he did. He made his interpretation of what I said, but he's actually right on almost everything. And I might have said that, you know, that uh, these guys uh, will actually be taught a lesson. And I'm very convinced about it. I'm making the same point here that I'm here to teach them a lesson because they've, they've touched, they've stepped on me. No one steps on me. I will rather die on my feet then live on my knees. And if these guys don't know that, they will learn that lesson. The second lesson I want to teach them, very important lesson, is that they are our servants. And if they don't know that, then we will teach them as a public that they are our servants. Therefore, they must not trample upon the master. We pay for these politicians. We pay for the bureaucrats. All these people are paid from our hard work and our earnings. These guys have to keep themselves to the law they stick to the law and minimize any any in, in intrusion on our liberty the biggest thing in the law if you look at carefully in the constitutions everywhere it is that thou shalt not do certain things but they have broken all the laws and that's why the manifesto that i'm working on is about saying thou shalt never break any more laws and i'm also working on mechanisms by which this will never happen again but really the problem has been this time that our servant has gone and essentially destroyed the master's house. Uh, these are this does happen sometimes. You know when the old master is old and the servant will go and actually brutalize the masters, and that's what they've done in this case because we were not watchful, we were not paying attention. I was actually very much hopeful that some lawyer or the other will pick up this whole thing being so stupid. Unfortunately, the lawyers who went to court were actually sustained by the courts. Our court system in Australia has. Uh, has failed us so bitterly that it's, it's mind-boggling. The, the Constitution says quite clearly, Section 92 says that there shall be complete free movement across Australia. Okay, for trade and intercourse, which means basically movement, uh, physical movement of people, uh, under no circumstance, there's no provision, there's no like, like a terms of reference, you know, uh, well, sorry, the terms and conditions in a contract at the bottom, fine print, that if this happens or if that happens, this is, you know, then no longer applicable or something. It's a very clear-cut thing. It says, thou shalt be free to go anywhere in Australia. Then the High Court of Australia says, no, Clive Farmer is wrong. And the government of Western Australia is correct. And what's the argument? They give the same stupid argument, which they gave, by the way, for the emergency declarations in Victoria, which is that these models. So, you know, the stupid, illegal, uh, biased, fake models, bogus by China paid people like uh, Ferguson, have been used across the entire uh, government system to defend, saying that if we don't do these lockdowns, we will get this massive number of uh, you know people dying. Sorry, number one, you never did lockdowns in the past. Number two, these models are completely wrong, and we can see that quite clearly from the month of April that they're completely wrong. So why did the High Court even give them that credence? That they that so what they're saying is you know it's very proportional because hey, we first of all create this monster 
of models, you know, saying that so many people would die. And then we say it's a precautionary principle. So, you know, as a precaution, we shut the whole bloody, you know, country down and shut the borders down. So what they've done is they misuse the law and the High Court of Australia has failed us. It is a dramatically sad situation for us. And so the people have to wake up and actually tell the High Court as well. We need to amend the constitution if necessary to say under no circumstances will the borders within the states be ever shut down. Under no circumstances will the international borders be shut down. Under no circumstances will there be this kind of lockdowns. I think if the, if the High Court is not able to understand the meaning of the constitution and the fact that it's supposed to protect liberty, if the High Court of Australia is that shoddy and so, so hopeless, then I think as a people, we have to rise and create a law and a constitution where even the fools who sit in the high court will understand that human liberty is what the purpose of the constitution was. It was not designed to protect the governments, but as designed to protect us. But they have protected the government. And I think my son, who's a lawyer, is doing a PhD, was telling me informally uh, that in, in Australia, apparently there's a, there's a long history of courts protecting the governments. Mm, against yes. the citizens this is a terrible news for me i mean i'm i came here thinking this is a free society and i find this is basically a totalitarian state in in disguise it's the wolf in disguise uh, as a sheep yeah well as you stated uh, you figured out uh, that the 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 other major party the liberal party was was not much better and uh, we saw uh, the the liberal premier of south australia stephen marshall lock, locked down his state in november last year uh, due to a small outbreak we've seen uh, gladys berejiklian and the liberal premier of new south wales even though she's not as uh, trigger happy on the the lockdown she is full on with the the qr code surveillance she's uh, uh, she's the one who's pushing that uh, we need to make the vaccines as mandatory as possible yes, uh, through through forms of uh, in incentives and uh, or big stick or or, or carrots, and uh, obviously we've we've got uh, the, uh, the 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 federal Liberal government still with the uh, Biosecurity Act banning international travel. Oh, they've extended that until uh, June uh, uh, 2021. So. Uh, uh, that's why you've you've launched uh, this uh, Team Australia to uh, empower because there, there there have been a lot, uh, particularly in Victoria, the uh, the two Liberal Democrat uh, MPs, uh, uh, Catherine Cummings, although she didn't please the crowd on uh, the, uh, the the rally against mandatory uh, vaccinations in in Melbourne, she's still uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the good ones and. Uh, in that news.com.au article, uh, it speaks about how you've been in communication with Craig Kelly, who's now an uh, independent, being one of the most uh, uh, outspoken federal uh, MPs. And uh, we have uh, Pete Evans now running for the, the Great Australian Party and the, the New South Wales Senate. So there are a lot of viable alternatives uh, popping up, but they need a lot of help uh, to go up against the, the major party machines, which is obviously what you want to assist with, with Team Australia. Yeah, so I actually hadn't spoken to Craig Kelly earlier, uh, but I managed to do so today, actually, uh, just fresh off the conversation today at five o'clock. Uh, it's a great Zoom call. And uh, I can definitely say that Craig uh, uh, is supportive of what uh, I've been doing. Um, he has uh, also, you know, uh, provided some thoughts on options and how to proceed further. He's a very seasoned politician, unlike me, who's got no actual experience of politics, but, uh, you know, theoretical politician of some sort in India. Uh, but in real life, uh, all these things happen about the proportions of this and that and so on and so forth, you know. So there's a lot of stuff which I don't understand. Nevertheless, the point I'm saying is that, and of course, I've been in touch with Pete Evans. So, uh, but, as I, uh, but I believe that the, uh, the, the contest here is not just with three or five or 10 people. It's 150 leaders that we need to find. Uh, high quality leaders who will contest all the seats um, in, in, in Australia in the federal elections. And then, of course, we need seats, uh, people contesting seats in the upper house, as well as uh, in the state elections next year in Victoria and elsewhere. Now, we're not prepared to contest any seats in Western Australia at this stage. So we're not doing that. But anything else might come up. Uh, we know we'll have a think about it. The challenge here is a matter of organization. So I keep telling people who have joined this movement that, look, uh, it's, it's very easy to talk like I'm talking. Okay, it's very easy, yeah. but it's a it's a completely different task to organize. Oh uh, yes, you know definitely. when 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 you're when you are fighting a war, this is a war for freedom. Uh, you don't just talk; you actually have to organize. 
And if you remember the War of Independence in the USA, uh, the war uh, of Oliver Cromwell against the, you know, uh, what is the is, uh, King Charles one or two, I forget, I think uh, uh, just missing. But with these wars uh, for freedom, they were the only few wars fought for freedom in the world history, including one in India, which took place in 1857. These wars uh, involve massive cooperation among people, people who would otherwise would never come together on the same table. So I'm actually asking people to let go their personal interests. This time Australia is burning and it's important that we all come together to save Australia. It's not, a, it's not impossible for us to actually become the ruling uh, coalition in Australia in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the next parliamentary elections. So we will be able, if you are successful and organized well, we can actually get both the Labour and Liberal Party out of power. Okay, so these guys can forget it forever. They can go home. We don't want them. What we do want, however, and I can't do it on my own. That's the whole point I keep making. It's not a one-man job. It requires an enormous amount of talent to step forward, to organize, uh, to organize the marketing campaign, the HR's, you know, back, back end, which says, who are the right candidates to do some vetting, start talking. I can't talk to 150 people. I can't talk to, you know, uh, 2000 uh, potential candidates who want to contest elections. So we want a, a lot of work to be done, uh, very highly high quality professional work. And we also need a lot of money and the money is required to print flyers, uh, brochures, you know, other material, publicity pamphlets and so on. And we want volunteers to go around, you know, setting up, sh uh, you know, a table in each shopping center. There's a lot of things to be done. Uh, so this organization is what's going to make the difference. What I'm saying here is just a, a, a delusion. It's just, it never will work. Uh, but I'm not delusional. And I, that's the reason I say I have managed very large organizations in my life. Okay. I come from a very senior civil, civil service role in India. We've managed 2000 people, for instance, and uh, I do know how to organize. Okay. So what I'm trying to bring is a little bit of a skill, which is different from that of an economist, which I've been working on here. I'm bringing my management skills, which are quite different. And I'm hoping that this management skill will be used to attract more high quality talent. I know that there are talented people across Australia. I'm, in fact, some wonderful people have already connected and I'm, I'm working with them. People like M with MBAs from uh, you know Melbourne School of Business, for example, some doctors and others, engineers, some brilliant people have connected already. I'm, I'm talking to them and giving them responsibility. This is actually about decentralization. At the end of the day, I don't have more than four or five quality hours where my brain is in functional capacity to function during a day. I, uh, but because the other stuff one can do, but you know, to produce really good quality output, you need a clean brain. Everybody must therefore work independently and in a coordinated manner, letting go their personal, uh, you know, differences to fight for Australia's liberty. Because these guys have betrayed us, and we I, I've explained quite clearly how they betrayed us and, and how in how badly they betrayed us, and they're not listening. And when that happens, when the when the servant doesn't listen to the master, what is the master's job? To fire the servant. Now we can only fire them at the elections. We cannot fire them uh, just like that. There is no such provision. So uh, and and who fires it? It's not me. It's the millions of voters who are to fire these guys. How will they fire? Why will they fire? They only will fire if they're persuaded that the alternative model of, you know, that we are providing is a better sustainable model for Australia. So we're giving everybody a much better future freedoms in Australia. Businesses will succeed. Uh, there will never be anybody doing this kind of reckless thing that, you know, you can't plan anything. Uh, you can't start a business. You can't do a tourism business. You can't do a, uh, you know, anything in basically what that's doing. You cannot do any more in Australia. And that is something I can promise everybody in Australia who is listening to me. I will not let that happen under my watch. I will now here. I'm here to fight for my country because India is not my country at the moment. I'm a citizen here. I would love to fix India, but at the moment I need this to be fixed before I start doing anything else. So I'm with you. You're with, you know, we, you work with me, you work with our team, you become the team. You, you, you lead, you coordinate, you do everything. So this is an empowering system, but remember, it has to be selfless. We cannot be saying, okay, I, I want to be the leader and so on. I would rather that I, I don't have to contest elections. I would rather, you know, that I basically just support everybody. I'm not here to be a great leader or anything. I'm here to help everybody become leaders. So I would like Australian young people, particularly those with 20, 25 years of experience, uh, you know, pos possible life experience in terms of, uh, you know, uh, future uh, capacity to work for politically for Australia, to come forward age 30, 35 is my uh, ideal age for people who want to come forward for politics. 
uh, please come forward. I will uh, support you in whatever capacity, whatever 14 hours a day. To, I'll help you. Uh, but you have to organize and you have to do it in a very big way. Remember, none of this stuff will convert. Freedoms have never in human history. They've never come easily. And this time they've been set back in a, at, a, at a level that is completely unprecedented, never in the human history before. And by the way, the kinds of things they're bringing in, if we don't fight back now, you will not only be having the vaccine passports and the QR codes forever and forever and forever, but you will soon go to the next level, which is they will implant a chip inside your body. I can guarantee that. I can guarantee that you will become a completely surveilled person. At all times, the government will be watching you. The big brother is coming after you. And if you don't understand that and you're not willing to fight for it, it may become too late by the time you wake up. So please wake up. I am here to fight with you, to support you, but I cannot do the job of persuading the people of Australia to democratically remove all these politicians. <laughs> well, that was an inspiring pitch and people just need to look at your resume uh, that, that shows uh, you're not just a dreamer, you're a doer as well. With regard to the, you mentioned the, the, the microchip, but I'm always of the view that they don't need to make it that obvious. They've got all the technological advancements now to track you 24-7 without the, the need to, to make it more obvious. Now, I do want to finish off with, uh, uh, to obviously, Australia is your, your home country now, but uh, uh, in, uh, India is your, your native uh, country. You have a lot more knowledge about uh, the uh, uh, politics and the economy of India. Australia has always had a special connection with India because of our uh, British uh, colonial shared history, uh, probably the biggest uh, uh, cultural uh, 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 cultural similarity is uh, cricket, and uh, India demolished Australia over summer. Now uh, the the news reports that come in from the, the the global news networks they they talk about the current prime minister Nadira Modi as a polarizing figure. My superficial view of him from the outside is that. I like him. He's a free market guy. He is is doing his best to improve the 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 economic condition uh, of of India. Uh, and but obviously the the biggest issue in India is these uh, farm market reforms. And it's in Australia's geopolitical interest to to have a strong India to counter. Uh, the, the the continued rise of, of China. Uh, there have been border skirmishes between India and China of of, of recent times. Uh, where do you see the the current uh, the geopolitical strength and uh, also welfare of the Indian people under uh, Narendra Modi? So I think I, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is to go back. Uh, you know, historically, India has been the world's melting pot before the USA was even invented and did not even exist. I mean, obviously for thousands of years, which was the greatest nation on earth where anybody could go from any part of the world and settle down and they would be treated with respect and, and have complete freedom. And so you have migrants from, you know, Persia, etc., the Parsis, you have the people from Israel, you have virtually every part of the world merging into India because it was the world's freest society. Free society succeed. And so that was therefore the world's richest country for thousands of years. In fact, for 18 out of the past 20 centuries, in the, and that's uh, the formal official documents, uh, India was either the richest or the second richest nation in the world. You know, sometimes it was China, sometimes India, but it was it's only the last two centuries where it has become so, so weak. Now, the... Uh, again, the next step in historically is that of the uh, independence of India, uh, 1947. We see that India was uh, uh, very unfortunate, and that is why this book, which I just showed you here, you know, this book is actually entitled uh, "Breaking Free of Nehru." Can you see that here? Yes. So break. Yeah. Uh, let's unleash India. So what happened is uh, very sadly we managed to get uh, a great guy. He's otherwise a fantastic character. That's why I've, I've got a chapter in the front which I say I love him. At the same time, uh, he was an arch socialist. Okay. So he uh, basically nationalized, started nationalizing things. He destroyed India's constitution. As you go into the book in detail, you realize he destroyed all property rights and so on. His daughter finished the job basically took over all the entire banking system 
in the process, uh, these guys also completely took over agriculture marketing and also restricted the kind of amount of land you could own. And so it became a complete, they were copying China, they were copying the USSR. These are the models they were copying, okay? For, and the world thought that they are like a mixed economy because uh, uh, Fabian socialism is a really interesting concept. Uh, Sidney Webb and others, including George Bernard Shaw, were the founders of this uh, concept of Fabian socialism and Nehru was influenced by them. It's actually a kind of a socialism uh, through, democracy, uh, through the democratic process. Okay, so therefore, their mixed economy mo model with the heavy amount of uh, commanding heights of the economy, which is what Nehru wanted for India, which is that of the government, uh, that was the model. And it basically crushed India and made India bankrupt by 1991. Uh, India went completely bankrupt, could not pay back its debt uh, to anybody. And so it, uh, uh, its gold was flown to, to, the, to the UK by plane. All the gold from India, the, the central bank was sent to the Bank of England, and then the IMF lent India $5 billion. That led to the reforms, uh, the first wave of reforms of India, which was basically IMF driven, not by Indians, but driven by the IMF saying that thou shalt liberalize your, uh, 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 you know, the manufacturing sector and the, or the trade sector. Comes uh, this continues, uh, and then we uh, there was the, the other theme that was going on was that of the nationalism, Hindu nationalism. Uh, the organization called Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which is very very, it started at the time of Hitler. They they were actually uh, they were close to Hitler. They went to you know there were there were people from this organization who went and studied and copied the the models from Hitler and Mussolini and brought them to India. This organization believes that Hitler is the, the models of uh, national socialism, which is Hitler's socialism, which is why Modi is a national socialist, is not a free market here. Let me come to that. So this model of national socialism, which was adopted by his organization, he's a member of the RSS. The RSS is exactly the Nazi organization, the complete counterpart of that Nazi organization. What it believes is that the Hindus have a right to rule India. And that anybody else is a second-class citizen, and they have got specific, uh, you know, mention of the Muslims of India. By the way, Indian Muslims have been there for thousands of years, and that the idea that they would be not, you know, not considered natural Ind Indians would be so atrocious. But that's the ideology of Mr. Modi, and so Mr. Modi's party, uh, the BJP, at the time of Nehru, was actually completely zero. Nehru had a very strong secular, uh, you know, personality. He would not allow these people to get any any oxygen. And the country didn't want to divide themselves into Hindu-Muslim because we would seen plenty of rights uh, in the independence period. Uh, next, uh, after, after Indira Gandhi's death, there was a complete vacuum. Indira Gandhi was killed in a bomb. bomb uh, sorry, she was, she was killed by, not by bomb blast, but she's killed in a, by her own bodyguard, okay, who shot her down. Uh, there was a complete vacuum uh, in 1983, 84. Uh, and then this BJP started uh, promoting his, that is the RSS. And Modi was at the front of this. Modi used to go around in this chariot called the Rath Yatra, going around creating a frenzy against the Muslims. So most, Modi's entire career was political career is based on mo, uh, hatred for Muslims. Uh, I mean, the amount of speeches he's given, the amount of stuff on my blog you'll find about his divisive, you know, uh, divisiveness uh, in India. He managed to bring all the Hindu votes together. And that is why he got elected with 300 votes, uh, 300 seats in the parliament this time, which is quite big. Nehru last had uh, about 300 seats, but this time he's managed to get 300 uh, seats. So n the second thing that uh, Modi did, which is to mislead the world completely about his so-called market uh, you know, reforms. And I've got plenty of articles in Times of India explaining why he's, he misled the world. Uh, he had no intentions. He kept on saying he wants a minimum government, maximum governance. He, he did not mean a single word of that. He expanded the government in the last many years that he's been there, five years. He's in, improved, increased the, you know, the tariffs. He's, in, he's restricted the, uh, the, the uh, goods that consumers can buy. Now, suddenly from nowhere, and absolutely suddenly from nowhere, he's introduced market reforms. Now, market reforms are in my book. They're in our manifesto of the Indian political party. And uh, these market reforms, we welcome them. The way, however, they've been done without any consultation whatsoever. And second, they have not complete reforms. They're only a small segment of the reforms that will actually potentially benefit the very large companies. So you can, you can imagine the Nazi Germany was very successful and productive, if you remember, in Hitler's time. And uh, the reason for its productivity was because it was very closely aligned with the big business. And people like Henry Ford were, you know, funding Hitler, and so we had a very strong nexus between the the, the national socialists in Hitler's time and and the production of the economy. 
So likewise, in India, there has been a massive growth in the in the big businesses out there, okay, which are basically Adani, Ambani, and and the lot. Uh, these people are likely to benefit from the reforms. Uh, that's the perception among the farmers who actually wrong in this case, because I believe I've read the laws. The, the laws are actually quite good and they will allow for greater competition. So in a submission from our political party, which is drafted by me and lodged just last month uh, to the Supreme Court of India, I've, ex I've argued that these reforms should be continued. But I've also given some other suggestions. I won't go into details now. But the summary of the whole thing, uh, to summarize the position, is that India is still a, a totally socialist country in every sense of the word. I can go on for another show. You know, for four hours, I can go on that. Uh, India has not been helped by Modi in any way. His party has divided India. He is a divisive figure. And of course, it's been noted across the world in many places. The people who are Muslims in India are being brutalized in, in so many ways that it is mind boggling. You should see the kind of you know, reports coming out from India about the brutalization of Muslims. Lynchings, lynchings have taken place. People are walking on the road and they're lynched. So uh, the country has uh, landed up in very bad times with Modi. And uh, I believe that uh, people are waking up finally. So our political party is starting to make a difference, a small difference in uh, northern, uh, in some parts of the Uttar Pradesh state. It's very small. But we are expect we're starting to see an uptake of liberalism, genuine secularism, where all Indians have the same rights and same liberties, and we are not following Hitler. Modi is a complete follower of Hitler. In fact, the book Mein Kampf, Mein Kampf is found in every bookshop. It is on, it is displayed openly. It is one of the big, most best-selling books of India because the RSS, the organization to which Modi belongs, loves Mr. Adolf Hitler. So now you tell me uh, the amount of misleading nonsense that we hear about India's free market. I can, I can sort of, you know, clarify India is not in such a good position. India is in a very bad state, therefore very poor, continues to remain very poor. And uh, all the opportunities for freedom, etc., have been lost. And that is why I'm fighting both now socialism and I'm fighting Nazism in India. Well, you've completely shattered, demolished my superficial perceptions of, 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 of Modi. And well, this is, uh, th this is why you've been such a great guest to, to have on the show. You've got knowledge, not just here about our government, but also uh, the, the, the truth about the, the current situation in in india so i have thoroughly enjoyed having you on the show sanjeev so as the audience uh, as well the 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 comments uh, they've been very both entertained and inspired by you because you're both knowledgeable and passionate and will both see more more of you and also read more of you uh, your your website again i'll i'll spell it out it's s a b h l o k city C-I-T-Y uh, dot com. And that's got all the links to uh, your other uh, uh, sites as well. And you're on a multitude of uh, social media platforms as well. <laughs> Although I've been banned on many as well. Yes, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you. Take care. And we'll, we'll talk again soon. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.